Supplements in the bodybuilding industry. What's good, what's bad, and what's eh, on the fence. There's a lot of conflicting information, and what I cannot promise you is that today we are going to answer all of those conflicts. Might just muddy the waters a little bit more, but I'll give you my opinion on all of that. The good, the bad, the stuff that's worth it, the stuff to avoid, and a whole lot more on this episode of The Drop Set, which is the Too Cool for School edition, episode 251. Let's hit it. Hey everybody, welcome to The Drop Set, episode 251. I am Darren Starr, your host for the next, eh, I don't know, 35 to 60 minutes, however long it takes. I have no idea. Um, as always, a gossip-free and bro-science-free zone. Welcome one, welcome all. We've got a lot to get to today. Um, the shades, the too cool for school edition for those watching on YouTube. Um, I'm still dealing with the pink eye situation, which is less horrific now, uh, but it's still distracting enough that the shades are less distracting than looking at my mangled eye, which is at least no longer swollen shut. When I recorded the prep vlog, um, which I'll put a card for in the corner here, uh, if you're on YouTube, you can click over and check that out. Um, it was, I was miserable. Like it was just awful. I've been off from the gym today as day four. I think I'll be ready to go back tomorrow. Um, I've been on some antibiotics, so it should no longer be contagious. Uh, being less than 10 weeks out from a show, I'm kind of feeling the crunch. So um, taking four days off, it's been kind of a nice little rest. I would rather it have been a choice than forced, but uh, either way, um, what, what's done is done. So uh, we got a lot to get to today. So let's just jump right in and cover it here. And I will like scoop myself over here, bring up yonder PowerPoint. There we go. All right, 251. Here we go. Um, how do I do this? There we go. All right. Today is not quite April 4th, 2024. Um, actually, it's April 5th, the day that I will post this. I was going to record it on the ap on April 4th. Today is actually April 3rd because I'm too busy on the 4th to record this. So I'm recording this two days early, which I think might be the first time in the history of this podcast I have ever intentionally recorded an episode two days early. That is how on the spot I am. Oh my God. little pat on the back for me. I'm going to try not to throw my shoulder out in the process of doing that, but man, okay. So I want to talk about what actually happens on show day. Like, what do you expect? Um, you know, uh, my client Dave, who is getting ready for a show on Saturday, this will be of no help to him unless he listens to it on his drive to the show on Saturday, on Friday night. Um, but we've talked about it. But he's just like, I don't have any idea what to expect. And here's the thing. For your first show, you never know what to expect. And honestly, for your second show, you think you know what to expect, but you may not because it could be a totally different experience. So I'm going to lay out all the things that are variables on show day. And we're going to talk about that and just go over kind of some of the scenarios that might unfold. Next relevant for me right now, adapting to sickness and missed time. How do you deal with being sick um, when you're on prep, uh, when you're in a cut, when you're in a growth phase? Um, what are the kind of things that you watch for as far as how to adapt to that? Um, what kind of expectations need to shift? What are some worst case scenarios? All of those kind of things, we'll talk about it. But we're going to jump in first on supplements. What supplements are actually worth the money? And that is the qualifier that I make here because there are supplements that do things but nobody's given to you for nobody's given them to you for free. So are they worth the associated cost? I kind of answer that for anybody because I don't know what your budget is. So we're going to talk about all that here. So supplements, worth it or waste it? We're going to chuck everything into one of two bins here. So let's go and start with the basics. And the first thing, this is probably the single most common question that I get asked as a coach all the time, and nobody likes my answer on this, but it's about creatine. Um, so a few things about creatine. First of all, it is a cell volumizer. It pulls water into the muscle, and a more volumized cell, in theory, is able to perform better. There will be an increase in strength, which can lead to an increase in size over time. Um, as far as some specifics, there are many types available. The only type that is worth um, anything at all is creatine monohydrate. They all do the same thing. Some of them supposedly do it without water retention, um, but... I mean, the water retention is kind of the key mechanism for how creatine works. So um, I would argue that uh, the more expensive products like crealkaline, et cetera, um, not worth it. Definitely not worth it. Um, creatine has been studied to death. It has been clinically studied to death. And um, the thing is, it clinically does what it says that it does. Um, 
So why then, Darren, do you not recommend creatine, which I typically don't? It is situational, um, but I find that for most people, it is not terribly effective. We'll get to that in a moment here. Um, you need to meet your expectations because you hear anecdotally, like people are like, Hey, I started taking this, you know, I gained a few pounds, water weight. Um, and I mean, there's a little bit of an ego boost. So what I'm really going to do is pop your placebo bubble here. Um, because most of what people experience on creatine, as far as practical outcomes that they experience are placebo effect. I hate to say it, but the problem with creatine is that it does what it says it does, but the results are insignificant enough that it really doesn't have any practical impact with the key exception being if you're really brand new, it can have an impact there. But also like if you're brand new, anything you do works. So do you really need creatine at the same time? Like if you're an intermediate to advanced lifter, is creatine going to make enough of a difference to where it, it provides any kind of noticeable increase in performance? Like, are you going to get extra reps or put extra weight on the bar because you're taking creatine? No. Um, it's just not, it doesn't work at that scale. So I personally don't take it. I have taken it in the past and then I have not taken it and I experience absolutely no change whatsoever in performance, whether I'm taking it or not. Um, so I don't, and therefore I don't recommend it because it is inexpensive. It is not free. And as a coach, I like to recommend things that I think are worth the money and creatine is not. Now, if somebody says, Hey, I got money. Okay, cool. Um, uh, everything in this category that we're talking about here, nothing's going to hurt you, right? The question is, I mean, some things will. None of the things we're going to talk about today, with maybe one or two exceptions, are going to hurt you in any way. Um, but uh, the, the issue is just one of efficacy and cost, and your budget factors into that a little bit as well. So creatine gets a not recommended, but eh, maybe like... You know, if somebody's like, I really want to take it, I'm like, cool, go for it. You know what? I mean, I'm not going to, you don't have to twist my arm on that one. It's not worthless. It's just not a powerful enough of a product to really have any kind of measurable effect on performance that you're going to note in your output in the gym. So therefore, uh, I'd rather focus on things that are going to be more important. For example, if you think that creatine is the solution to your problems, but you're not logging your workouts, log your fucking workouts because you're going to get way more out of that than you ever will out of any supplement. So <laughs> the, like get your priorities straight. If you're already logging your workouts, you're doing everything, creatine, good. And maybe it's good for a 0.3% boost, something like that. It's not zero. It's just not much. Next up, BCAAs. Um, so BCAAs, these are branch chain amino acids. These are leucine, valine, and isovalene. God, it's been so long. <laughs> I should, I should have those right on the tip of my tongue, but I'm like, what is BCAAs? Uh, alternatively, you could throw EAAs into this mix, which are not just the branch chain amino acids, but all nine essential amino acids. Um, so uh, those products are fairly interchangeable as far as their efficacy, what they are purported to do, and my recommendation on them. Um, these are needed. They are. Yes, absolutely. They are needed. But do we need them in supplement form? Um, the answer is probably not. Um, there has been research done over the years that suggests that there are, that there is a mild performance enhancing, um, aspect to this that can boost endurance. It can boost output. Um, and then more recent studies have shown like, no, it, it doesn't do that at all. So, uh, basically like you, you need branch chain amino acids, but every protein source that you eat, that's a complete protein contains a lot of branch chain amino acids. We have enough of them and supplementing with more is uh, not conclusively effective. So therefore, and you know, BCAAs typically are going to cost, um, you know, creatine. Here's the thing. You can get a tub of it um, for relatively inexpensive and that tub could last you for four months. BCAAs, if you get a container of that, it's going to be about a month and that container is going to be about twice as much as creatine. So it's around six to eight times more expensive per month for BCAAs. And, um, so I was aware of the research for some time, but I only stopped using them recently. Um, just because it was habit. Like I've been using BCAAs for 20 years. And then I thought about how much money have I spent on BCAAs over the last 20 years? And then I stopped and then I haven't ordered them since I've been off for several months. Now, my recommendation from clients has gone from yes, take these to eh, optional. Um, I'm not willing to totally give up the ghost on BCAAs yet. I think we do still need a little bit more research. Uh, but 
it's it's one of those things like again the cost associated with it is it worth it i don't see the value in it myself based on the on the research that's out there right now so um it's another one that i will poo poo eaa's no difference um a lot of people will like more sophisticated lifters will will say i take essentially you know acids eaa's i'm like good for you they're doing the exact same thing as bcaa's which is likely not much next up we have glutamine so um this is also a non-essential amino acid this comes from food as well and uh there is questionable value in supplementing this because we get plenty of it from food um glutamine has been studied to be um grass generally regarded as safe at quantities up to 40 milligrams per day. Um, but safe and effective are two different things. So hypersaturating yourself with glutamine, what does that do? Nothing, um, absolutely nothing. So it's another one of those, I put it in the same category as BCAAs, have taken it for years. Evidence is very questionable that it does anything worthwhile. And um, at this point, it is a the softest of recommendations for me like, eh, I'm not so sure about that. We do a cost analysis though on this stuff. And uh, these three by themselves, you can spend 70 bucks a month on these three. So uh, the question becomes, what does your budget look like? And if money is no object, these aren't gonna hurt you. But I also feel like that is kind of a lame reason to take a supplement because it's not gonna hurt you. Well, what's it gonna do for you? Like, I feel like a supplement, if it's gonna work its way into your supplement cabinet, should make the case for it and not just saying like, well, You've taken me before and I haven't hurt you, right? Like, that's just not good enough. And I just don't think that the um, the evidence is there convincingly enough for me to encourage my clients to spend money on this stuff. And that that's kind of the approach that I take on it. So my recommendations as a coach on all three of these um, is, nah, save it, save it. And that, that's been a fairly recent change within the past six months or so. So um, creatine, I've, I've felt this way about it for years. Um, you know, there, there, you can have a lot of debates about creatine. It is one that is just, uh, it, it's slightly ambiguous still. Um, I, a, a lot of what I rely on is my own personal firsthand experience with it, which is to say, if I take it or not, there is absolutely no difference in my output whatsoever. So um, no noticeable difference at all, at all. And so therefore, it's like, why would I recommend that? Now, if you're new to lifting, it can have a little bit more benefit. Um, but again, it's, it's a, a pretty soft recommendation. So um, let's dig a little bit deeper here and go for some additional items here, like a pre-workout, for example. Um, so a pre-workout is another one that I don't recommend to clients for a different reason. And that is that many of these pre-workout products are so convoluted and loaded up with shit. Not that it's bad, but there's just so many different things in them that the likelihood that somebody is gonna have some kind of a negative reaction to it is relatively high um, for me as a coach. So I don't wanna recommend something. This is also why I don't recommend thermogenic fat burners usually because a lot of people will feel like very shaky, a little low grade nauseous from that. And I don't, I don't like recommending stuff that makes people feel bad when we're trying to make ourselves feel better. So um, I will tell people like, I take a pre-workout every day. Um, I've found several that I've liked over the years. I'm currently use, using a stim free pre-workout from raw nutrition, um, which I quite like. Um, and that's one where I can tell the difference, um, when I take it, like the blood flow is just a little bit better. The pumps are a little bit easier to come by. Um, and if I, I'm also open to the idea that there may be a little bit of internal bias in my head about this, where if I forget it for some reason, which I did once about a month ago, I just forgot my shaker cup at home that had it in it. And it, like I still had a good workout, but it just felt like there was a little bit of an edge missing and there, there could be a little confirmation bias in that. So, um, but I am, I am a believer in it. So I'm not a, uh, I've, I've long touted myself as being a supplement skeptic. I'm not skeptical on pre-workout. Um, I just don't like to recommend it just because a lot of people are very sensitive to beta alanine, for example. A lot of people are very stimulant sensitive. So if you recommend something that has all these ingredients with it, somebody takes it and they feel like, oh, shaky, I feel like crap. I'm like, I don't want to be the guy that recommended that. So if somebody is using one already, I'll say, hey, continue. Absolutely. If somebody asks me for a recommendation like, hey, should I try it? Be like, I just tell them the whole thing that I just said here. Like, I take one, feel free. I don't have a recommendation for you. Um, go read some labels. Here are some ingredients to watch for and see if you can find something. Also, you know, try and see if you can get it from a place, a, a reputable supp supplement company that's local that has a return policy that'll take an open container back if it makes you feel like ass. So um, that's usually the best, the best tactic to take. Um, testosterone boosters, and I'm going to put DHEA in this category as well. So um, testosterone boosters, I'm looking at things uh, 
like, uh, you know, tribulus extract things, horny goat weed, ashwagandha would be a key ingredient in a lot of these products. Um, there's about eight or nine ingredients that are common in these. Um, do they do anything? Yes. Uh, it's a, it's a similar thing to creatine, however, where do they do enough to make a difference? No. Um, if you have borderline low testosterone or low testosterone, cool. You can take one of these, your testosterone levels will improve. You will still be low test. It's not going to take you out of that level. It's not going to take you from 250 up to 700. It can take you from 250 up to 270 or 280. Like, and that's just not enough to make a difference. You will not feel that difference at all. If you triple your test going from 250 to 750, you'll feel that that's great. And the way to do that is with TRT, not with a, a test booster in pill form. DHEA is commonly used, especially among women to boost testosterone levels. Um, it's kind of like a pre TRT option. The only problem is over the counter DHEA doesn't work like that. It would have to be a prescription DHEA to have any kind of an impact on serum testosterone levels. So this is one where over the counter DHEA really brings no benefit to the table at all. Let's talk GDAs, glucose disposal agents. So these are things that people will often use um, in a growth phase when calories are getting high um, because, as the name implies, they can help your body dispose of glucose. So um, what you can find if you are um, uh, really, really getting your intake high, and that number, that, you know, Intake high, he says with finger quotes, um, is a relative term. You know, if you're accustomed to taking in 200 grams of carbs per day on average, then 275 might be high for you. 275 for me is a low day. 900 to 950 is a high day for me. Um, so do you need a GDA? Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, I would argue, no, you might need something else. Um, a GDA is just, it's overcomplicating the solution to a pretty basic problem, which is the more you eat, the more likely you are to experience blood sugar dysfunction. And when your blood sugar gets up to a certain level, up into like the triple digits, 110, something like that, um, it starts to cause some deleterious health effects that we don't want. We want to avoid that stuff. And this is the problem. I mean, it's, it's a problem with eating too much with, you know, excess weight gain in general. You know, your blood sugar goes up, which can cause organ dysfunction. It can lead to blood pressure dysfunction as well. So it's, it's bad news. And so you do want to control your blood sugar and keep it managed. And a GDA can help with that. You know what else can help with that, though? is just the main ingredient that's in most GDAs, which is berberine, which you can find for about a third the price. So just get berberine and take that. Um, a GDA is, again, it's overcomplicated by adding in a whole bunch of other ingredients um, when berberine is the thing to take. Or um, if you really need the help, um, metformin, which is prescription, um, is going to do a much better job of regulating your blood sugar um, than even berberine will. So berberine is kind of like the over, over-the-counter light version of metformin. They work in similar ways. Um, but if you're experiencing some mild dysfunction, berberine can help tamp that down. And what you're basically doing is just increasing the headroom and buying yourself a little bit more time in that growth phase. Eventually, though, you're going to experience enough dysfunction. You're going to need to um, bring down um, intake and go into a little bit of a mini cut, strip away some body fat, regain your insulin sensitivity. Um, so a GDA is a Band-Aid, much like berberine is a Band-Aid. It's just berberine is cheaper. So just take that if, if you're in a situation where you need that. Um, a multivitamin, honestly, I think this is a no-brainer. There was a study that came out a while back saying that multivitamins uh, are a net negative. Um, that study was um, full of holes and inconclusive. Um, uh, now, it could, be, it could be supported by future studies, but right now it's just kind of like a duh thing. Okay, so for 12 bucks, I can get this thing of a multivitamin that supplies 100% of most everything that I need, and this thing will last 90 days. Uh, okay, great. And so I can do that instead of worrying about micromanaging all of my B vitamins, my A, D, E, and K, all of my minerals and micronutrients. And it's like, God, yeah. So it can take away the headache of making sure you're getting all that stuff from food. Just get it from your multi. It's a Band-Aid to put over everything, but it's a Band-Aid that's effective. It's an absolute no-brainer for me. So multivitamin is the one thing that I will universally recommend to everybody. That and omega-3 oil. So a combination of EPA and DHA. Um, fish oil is the standard here. Um, krill oil I find to be um, a little bit more um, appealing. Um, people always talk about fish burps with fish oil. I have never experienced that in my life. I almost feel like it's 
I, I'm, it's probably a thing, but since I've never experienced it and, you know, confession, I have burped in my life after taking fish oil. Like I've done it on purpose just to see, is there a fishy taste? No. Huh. Okay. I don't know. Like, I feel like it's a thing that's made up almost like, and people are probably going to chime in like, no, it's a real thing. I'm, I'm sure it is, but it feels kind of made up. You know, it's like, why don't I experience this? Am I somehow magically immune to fish burps? I don't know. Um, krill oil has some um, some positive effects for cholesterol. So um, if your cholesterol is a little bit skewed, um, it, it would be one that I would recommend for that. Um, and also, like, if you don't know, if you haven't had your blood work checked, first of all, probably should, but also, like, eh, fish oil, krill oil, same difference. Like, take the one that's going to provide a little bit more benefit for your cholesterol. Sure. Um, vitamin D is one that I think is worth mentioning just because um, – Depending on where you live, depending on your lifestyle, you could very easily be vitamin D deficient. And I think, um, you know, a blood test will tell you for sure. But also, like, if you live in a place where, you know, you don't get a lot of sun, if you spend a lot of time indoors, you can probably make an educated guess that you are um, low on vitamin D, if not deficient. And I wouldn't take 50,000 IUs per day, but like 5,000 IUs, sure. Um, I think that's kind of just a reasonable safeguard. Um, if you live in Florida and you're out on the beach all the time, you probably don't need it. You're probably fine. Um, but for most of us, like me, you know, I live in here <laughs> 37 hours a day. This is where I go. They don't let me out of this cage. This is where I am all the time. So yeah, I'm probably a little vitamin D deficient. Absolutely. So um, that's why I take it daily, 5,000 IUs. So um, how much of this stuff do I take? I take pre-workout, don't take a test booster, don't take a GDA, do take a multi, do take krill oil, do take vitamin D. Um, situational use. So I do take a couple of things for cholesterol simply because my HDL is lower than I would like. Um, there are some things, situational use. So if you get blood work back and there's a little bit of dysfunction, like your thyroid panel looks a little bit off, your lipids are a little bit skewed, there are some things that you can take for this. You can take like an uh, inositol or a, oh, what is the... Uh, uh, selenium um, supplement for thyroid. Um, for cholesterol, there are things like plant sterols, plant pantothene, aged garlic, grapeseed extract that can help boost HDL a little bit. And some of those may impact your LDL and lower that a little bit as well. Not huge changes, but it's enough where, you know, you stack a bunch of those things together. It can almost be as effective as taking a weak statin. So, you know, you avoid a prescription med, just take some natural stuff. Um, I mean, I say natural stuff. Of course, all this stuff is processed to shit. People talk about like, I don't want to eat anything processed. Every supplement is processed all to shit. So if you want to be natural, never take a supplement. I'm just telling you. Processing is not bad. That's how products get delivered to us is through the through the uh, the process of processing. So um, let's. I'd like to kill that off as a buzzword. No processed foods. Like the act of farming something is processing it realistically. So... Um, I don't know. Um, also, there, there are additional specific vitamins and minerals, things like, you know, calcium, magnesium, um, potassium, sodium, which, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever taken a sodium supplement. Like, we get plenty of that, right? Um, potassium supplements are not uncommon because it is hard to get potassium from the diet, but it's always more effective to do so from the diet. Um, other stuff is, again, going to be very situational. If you come back and you're deficient on any of things, then certainly... Um, it's uh, uh, one of those things that I would probably, you know, issue a recommendation for at that point. But I'm not going to just blanket like, yes, everybody should take magnesium. Like, why? Like, what's the need for it? Um, now, some magnesium-based supplements can have certain effects that are trying to solve a problem. So you don't necessarily need to show a magnesium deficiency in order to take like a magnesium-based supplement f as a laxative or as a sleep aid or something like that. So uh, sometimes just uh, a symptomatic um, response is good enough. Like if you're showing the symptoms, sure. Go for it. You don't necessarily need empirical evidence showing that something is low. Um, and then another thing that's worth mentioning here is peptides, because I get asked about this a lot from clients. Um, and uh, I issue a blanket recommendation of no to all peptides, because uh, by and large, none of them are human tested. And they're all coming from sources where quality is suspect, at least. Um, so the peptides, uh, I'm talking about things like CJC, Ipamorel, and BPC-157, um, which is touted as some kind of a miracle cure for soft tissue issues, which all that evidence is anecdotal. There's no studies um, uh, done to see, you know, talk about potential side effects of short or long-term use. 
And so as a coach, like I'm not going to recommend stuff if we don't know what the downsides are. Uh, and with all peptides, we don't know what the downsides are. Same thing with SARMs. No, um, it's just a, it's like an absolute no. And I have many clients who are like, well, I have this, I'm going to take it. I'm like, that's on you. I am, I'm advising you not to, um, there are better things that we could do. Um, and it's just not necessary. So, um, peptides get a, uh, hard pass for me. Quick time out here and thanks again for watching. So podcasting is fun for me, but coaching is how I actually make a living. <laughs> Being an online coach has been my exclusive full-time gig for coming up on 15 years now. Hard to believe that. If you're looking for a coach, either for competition prep or just to get in the best shape of your life, you can check out fivestarphysique.com and click on coaching for details on the programs that I offer. Quick version here, I get a ton of information up front to create a starting plan and then we check in weekly to adjust that as we go based on your specific goal and the timeline involved. There's loads of detail up on the website, so I'll keep this short. Just check out fivestarphysique.com for details. The link is in the description below. I do take on a limited number of clients and want to have a little bit of back and forth before starting up just to make sure that we're a good fit. So check out the website, read up and hit the contact button to reach out to me directly. Okay, back to it. Okay, and because everybody loves more ads, I just figured I would tell everybody really quick, um, if you go to fivestardigital.com, that's star with two R's, five spelled out, F-I-V-E, star with two R's, digital.com, that is my new website for online courses that I will be launching. Um, it is a little rough around the edges currently. Um, I would say it's not yet officially live. But it is there, and I have one course that is currently available for pre-order called Bikini Blueprint, which I'm excited to bring to the masses here. Um, I won't uh, bore you with a whole spiel for it here, but if you are interested in a program that covers training, training theory in depth, nutrition, logistical approaches, mindset, day-to-day -day routine, and even an intro to PED section specifically for women talking about bikini and wellness categories, um, then check it out. That's at uh, fivestardigital.com and click on the links for Bikini Blueprint. You can check that out there. So moving on, um, adapting to sickness and missed time. First thing we need to have here is my mouse focused on the right window. There we go. A reality check. Um, this is probably the biggest concern that people have when it comes to being sick is like, Oh no, I'm going to lose all my gains. Muscle loss is a slow process. Building muscle is slow. Losing muscle is slow. It's all slow and it all sucks because it's slow. Usually we're more worried about building muscle being slow, but the bonus to that is that muscle loss atrophy is also slow, which means if you're sick for a week, it doesn't fucking matter as far as the long-term picture of killing gains or anything like that. So my, my first um, p bit of advice would be chill the F out. Like, yes, you're sick, whatever, it's fine. Every bodybuilder in the history of planet Earth, every Mr. and Miss Olympia, um, every Olympia competitor has been sick, and they all got through it and everybody's fine. Think of it this way. Most, I would say, uh, well, I don't know about most, a good percentage, a healthy percentage of competitive bodybuilders have undergone surgery at some point, which is a weeks, if not months long recovery process, um, which has you out of the gym much longer than you would be out for sickness. And they've all recovered from that and bounced back just fine too. So you can be sick for a week and it doesn't matter. Don't panic. It's fine. Everybody's going to live. Nobody's going to die. Your gains are still there. Everybody gets sick. It's fine. So um, there's your reality check. But the one thing that you should do uh, early on is just adjust your expectations while you're sick. And I'm just going to call sick, again, finger quotes here, um, as being anytime you're missing gym due to illness. So this could be COVID, flu, pink eye, um, what a strep throat, tonsillitis, tummy ache, stubbed toe, amputated finger. I mean, whatever. I mean, that's probably not sick. You know, that's, that's more of like a surgery thing. <laughs> well, let's walk that back a little bit, but you know, like, uh, you're, you're, you're sick in some sinus infection, whatever, something that's going to keep you out of the gym and keep you from working out either because you're contagious and you would be a rotten shit to go into the gym when you're contagious, which is the only reason that I'm out for pink eye. Like I feel fine. It has been a little tiring just because I have all this sinus drainage that goes along with it as well. 
that's easily managed with Sudafed. So I feel fine at this point. Um, but I'm not a hundred percent certain that I'm not contagious. So therefore I'm staying out of the gym. I think I'll be good. I will go back tomorrow. I will wash the shit out of my hands and I will wipe down everything after I touch it. So I think that's a reasonable precaution. Um, and so, uh, I'm comfortable with that. So anyway, it's something that keeps you out of the gym either because you're contagious or because you just don't feel well enough to perform. And I would say, I would throw into that feel enough, feel well enough to perform well. Also, if you can go in and give a 60% workout, stay home because a 60% workout is just checking the box and making you feel better about yourself. It's not doing anything productive. Um, like if you're going to do something, go outside and take a walk or something instead. Um, because a 60% effort workout is going to not be effective, but it's going to pull enough resources from your body that your immune system probably could use to fight off whatever it is that you're trying to fight off. So, um, we'll, we'll get to that more in detail here. Um, if you continue weighing in on a daily basis, as I do all, all the time, just keep in mind, the scales can do some weird shit, especially if you're on some kind of a medication. Um, cause medications can cause, you know, antihistamines can cause water loss. Um, uh, something like if you're on prednisone, it can cause water retention, like weird shit can happen. And so just you take it all with a grain of salt. For me, I always have a morbid curiosity. I always want to know what's going on. I just know that, okay, this data is a little skewed right here. Like, um, you know, I'm not taking anything right now that's going to impact my weigh in. So I'm watching, um, I'm watching my weight every day here. And I've been dropping pretty steadily for the last four days. Um, because it's also every day has been a low carb day, which is a whole other thing that sucks. Um, that's really the biggest downside of this sickness is having to have four low carb days in a row. Let me tell you F that. No, thank you. I don't want to do that again. Um, but, uh, where was I going with that? <laughs> uh, oh, I've been steadily dropping. And of course I'm like, well, it's low carb. I'm not training. So it's like, yeah, I'm in prep. I need to drop weight. This is fine. Right. But it's like glycogen stores are down. Um, I'm not being fed well. So I think once I, uh, I would fully expect once I get back in and have a regular or a high carb day, which I will do, I'll do a regular day tomorrow when I go train back to catch up on that. And then I'll have a leg day and a high carb day on Friday. Um, so, uh, the scale might tick back up a little bit as glycogen stores fill back out. So that's just more of the weird shit that's going on here. Just keep in mind, it's the concept of atrophy versus glycogen depletion. So glycogen depletion happens in a couple of days. And so you might see the scale drop down, um, and you do that and you see that. And so therefore you think it's muscle loss, but muscle loss takes longer than a few days. Um, it's just a loss of fullness, which it doesn't help that it kind of feels and looks like muscle loss as well, but it's not, it's just the fullness of the muscle tissue from glycogen. It's not atrophy. Atrophy is an actual reduction in tissue size. So not just, um, water in the tissue. Uh, it's kind of like being post vacation, you know, I mean, here's the other thing. Everybody's been sick. Everybody gets sick. Everybody goes on vacation. And when you go on vacation, you should take some time off from the gym then too. That's what we all survived that too. The difference here, the key difference is that vacation is voluntary. Sickness is not. And so therefore in our heads, sickness is much worse because we didn't choose it. Whereas, um, I think most people, and there are exceptions to this, but most people are comfortable, um, with the concept of taking time off from the gym. And if you're not, I would strongly encourage you to get to the point where you are comfortable with that. It's good for you to take some time off. Um, so it is very common to feel fat and soft right now, even when you're eating less, just because glycogen stores are depleted. Um, you know, there's no pump, there's no fullness. Everything's just going to feel a little more squishy. Probably that's a temporary thing. Like I know when I get back into the gym tomorrow, I feel like a fat tub of goo right now, but, uh, I get a pump back and I'm like, Whoa, all right. And I've had four days off, so it should hit like a ton of bricks. So I'm kind of expecting that for tomorrow. Um, also with sickness, it just depends. Um, your appetite is often impacted, but not always. So fatigue can really pile up very quickly as well. So, you know, you might think like, I think I'm good enough to go to the gym. And then you get in there and you're two sets in and you're like, holy crap. Uh, so just know that you're not yourself. Right. So, um, like take, take the extra day. It's the smart move. As far as adjusting your routine, um, you know, w when you're out and, and I would say this, this applies to me here as well. You take rest, you take your rest days, but it's not really restful per se. Um, like if you're sick, your body is not at rest. So you're taking a non-training day, but it would be misleading, I think, to call it a rest day because your body is still kind of fighting and it's still working hard enough that it can't be, it can't be described as at rest. So, um, 
you can be like, oh, I had the flu. I was out for a week. I should be well rested. No, you had a shitty week is what you had. You had a week that was really hard. You're not going to feel rested from that at all. It's probably going to take you some time to get back into the groove. Um, a lot of this is mindset also. Like some people are just excited to get back. And so even though they don't feel physically great, their mindset can overcome that and they just push through and it's fine. So um, consider your diet, you know, depending on, on the nature of your sickness, is your appetite impacted? Um, sometimes the goal is really just to kind of keep some calories coming in, whatever they're coming in from. Um, you know, if you're like, Ugh, like soup and crackers, you know, what sounds good? Just don't eat nothing. Have something coming in, whatever you can. If you're like, all I can stomach is brownies. I'm like, cool. Eat some brownies. Don't eat 40 maybe, but you know, get some calories in um, and stay hydrated as best you can. Um, you know, a lot of the fatigue that comes from being sick is just not paying attention to the things that you normally do on your routine. And hydration is one of those. So, um, you know, if you're dehydrated, you're going to be fatigued and tired. Um, and so the last few days I am typically pretty bad. Um, I can admit this about staying hydrated on my rest days. So I've made a, a point of it to try and hydrate more for these last few days. So I, you know, a lot of my water comes in during my workout. I get about 60 ounces in during my training session. And if I'm not, uh, if I'm not training then I don't do that, I don't get that water. And so I've been, I've been filling up my jug with that and filling up my jar that I have at home from that, just so that I'm still in the routine of trying to empty through that jug and keeping myself a little bit more hydrated, even though my activity is being a lot, a lot lower now too. So, um, remain lightly active if you can, if it's appropriate, like make a judgment call on this. If you're like, yeah, I can get up and walk around. I'm fine. Cool. Do it. Do it. I mean, you, you will benefit from that, uh, lightly active is the key though. Um, on Monday, for example, so Sunday I started feeling a little off from this. Um, and Sunday evening, uh, was when really like the maiden congestion started and I was really feeling pretty crappy. Monday rolled, Monday was just a miserable day. Like, uh, <laughs> I, I was gonna say, I don't want to be too graphic, but there's nothing really graphic about it, but just to like, you know, one of the symptoms of pink eye is excess tear production. So it was just like, I mean, you would have thought that I had just had the worst breakup of my life. Like tears are just streaming down my face constantly all day long. It's just absolutely disgusting. And it, there's so much production of it that it, it kind of rolls back into your sinuses as well. And so uh, like just snotty and gross from that as well. And that is very fatiguing. So like when it came time to walk the dogs in the afternoon, I had to cut it at halfway. I'm like, yeah, I'm going back home now. <laughs> like, that's all I got in me. So, um, cause we do a loop, but at the halfway point, there's a shortcut home. So I took the shortcut. So, um, I bowed out. Um, and after that, like it was that night I started Sudafed and I slept really well Monday night going into Tuesday, which was yesterday at the time of this recording and, uh, felt fairly normal on Tuesday. And today, um, I honestly feel pretty damn good. So, um, it was a minimal impact for me, and thank goodness for modern, med modern medicine. Go Sudafed. You're, you're, you're the real MVP here. Um, and bed rest is fine if that's what it takes. You know, depending on, If you've got like debilitating COVID or flu symptoms and your whole body hurts, just stay in bed. Don't feel like you have to do anything. Um, the main goal when you are sick, I always say this. This is the mantra that I repeat with my clients always. Your goal is to get unsick as quickly as you possibly can. That's it. So anything that leads to that more rest, more hardcore rest, stay in bed, chicken soup, whatever, you know, whatever gets you some symptom relief so that you can continue to sleep well, whatever meds you have to load up on, who cares? Stick you full of horse tranquilizers and bullshit, like do it. Whatever it takes to get unsick as quickly as possible, whatever it takes to get the maximum amount of symptom mitigation, still getting some calories in your system, trying to stay a little hydrated and just getting some rest. That's what you got to do. So do you feel like you're ready to get back to the gym? Here's the big question. Consider taking an extra day. Um, today is that extra day for me. Like I feel like I'm absolutely good enough. Um, I do still think there's a chance that I'm contagious today. So that's another factor that goes into it. Um, but tomorrow I'll definitely be ready. So I, um, you know, based on the timing of when I started the antibiotics, I will no longer be contagious. I feel physically good enough to do it today. So, um, all, all systems go tomorrow for sure. Um, depending on the nature of the illness, just keep in mind like your performance might not be up to your usual specifications right away. And that is okay. Like give yourself time to ramp up to it. Um, I always tell people like if you're coming off of a week where 
you just are not, you know, you're sick and you're just not feeling great. We're like, I'm ready to get back to it. I always tell people, don't try and set the gym on fire your first day back and don't train legs on your first day back. Pick a small muscle group, something that you connect really well with, something that, you know, it's easier for you to have like a good shoulder day or a good arm day. Do that. Awesome. It's a smaller muscle group. It's less impactful. Um, it's less tissue that needs resources for recovery. Cool. Training legs on your first day back. I see people do this all the time. And I'm like, it's not going to kill you, but it's also not what I would consider the smartest move. So um, always remember, though, everyone gets sick. But the human body is amazingly resilient. So um, you will bounce back. And especially, you know, I've, I've, <laughs> I have clients who... Mitch, I'm thinking about you, man. He's been sick as a dog for this year, like several bouts of different sicknesses. It's COVID, it's the flu, it's this, it's whatever. He's like, God, can we just get a few weeks where things feel good? And uh, like right now, knock on wood, we're in the middle of that stretch for him, so which is great because he needs that. Um, but the human body, it will bounce back from whatever as long as it has time to. So, um, and also like compare your three to five days out of the gym versus like a six week post-op recovery for, you know, a, a hysterectomy or, you know, a, a labrum repair, which would be, you know, like two months. So, um, ag again, most, uh, I don't know, surgery is not always elective. Sometimes it is, but, um, oftentimes neither of these are by choice. Uh, and it, there is that differentiation. Like when you're taking a vacation, you're choosing to take time off from the gym. When you're sick, you're forced to take time off from the gym and that hurts more. And so I'm not uh, underselling the power of that difference. Like the fact that you don't have a choice in the matter does suck a good bit more, but it doesn't change the un underlying circumstance, which is you're going to be fine. This happens to everybody. The human body is resilient. Muscle memory is a real thing and you will bounce back probably a lot faster than you think. Hey everybody, I hope you're enjoying this episode. Just wanted to take a quick time out to tell you about a promotion I have going on now for my workout programs at fivestarphysique.com. I have around 50 uh, programs available as of right now. These are comprehensive workout splits for all people, goals, and phases. You can search by volume, general difficulty level, even the number of supersets involved so you don't end up with something that you can't properly execute because your gym is just too damn busy when you go to train. All of these programs do include full video demonstration playlists for each day narrated by yours truly so you know exactly what to focus on and what to watch out for on every move. These are ideal for all skill levels. You can use the promo code DROPSET, one word, at checkout to save 10 bucks on your first program. Link is in the description below or check out 5starphysique.com and click on workout programs. Okay, let's get back to it. And welcome back. If you're enjoying this, if you're on uh, YouTube, uh, consider giving the video a like, maybe subscribe to the channel if you think it's really awesome. Leave a comment and tell me uh, what kind of stuff you want to see discussed on future episodes, and I will be happy to do it. Uh, if you are listening, 80% um, of podcast listeners listen on Apple Podcasts, actually. So um, and it's a statistic I was not aware of because uh, I certainly don't. So I'm biased. I'm a Spotify guy. But on Apple, um, on Apple Podcasts, you can go and leave a star rating and also write a review. And so I've been asking for that for the last many weeks, and so far nobody has taken me up on not one single review has been written. So the last, the most recent one is that one star review that I talked about several weeks back and it's still sticking out there like a sore thumb. So uh, anybody, if you're getting anything out of this, I would really appreciate you drop a review. I'll give you a shout out on here in a future episode. So um, thank you. Enough self-promotion. Let's get on with it. What actually happens on show day? Um, well, I can tell you this, it's a shit show um, <laughs> almost universally on some level. So let's just talk about some generalities here. And the first thing is that every freaking show is different. Like nothing is going to be the same. Um, even the same show year to year is probably going to be different. Um, like if you do a show this year and you do that same show next year, don't expect that it's going to be the same. There are going to be some things that are different. Some years uh, everything goes smoothly. Some years there are interruptions that impact some people, everybody. It's just tough to say for sure. Um, the promoter of the show has massive influence over how smooth the show is run and the overall quality of it. So if you do a show and you're like, man, this show is really well run, look and see if that promoter has their hands in any other shows. And you can probably make a fairly broad based general assumption that those shows will be worth your time as well. Um, I think that's, that's fair to say. So, um, and also just like the, the attitude, the mindset and the, um, like the, 
the work ethic and the character of the promoter really um, tends to permeate throughout the show. So it's, it's a top-down kind of thing. The promoter sets the tone, and if that tone is good, it's, it's going to be positive vibes. And most shows are pretty good, um, but sometimes you know, a show can have a great vibe and be poorly organized at the same time. So let's talk about what makes a good show versus a bad show. Um, one of the first things is athlete amenities. And so this comes down to the promoter securing a venue that's really like ideal for a bodybuilding show. Um, so like, you know, do you have access to bathrooms that are easy to get to from where you're at? Um, and easy to get to often can mean like, well, it's a little bit of a trek, but I don't have to go outside and leave the building, for example, or something like that. Um, also certain venues will say like, Hey, because of the spray tan involved, you can't go in these places here. Um, because we don't want to have to deep clean and pay extra for, you know, cleaning your spray tan bullshit off of our walls here, or our carpets or whatever. So, um, and th this is oftentimes when there's a competitor's meeting before the show, which can always be an email. We need to never have another competitor's meeting ever again, please. I'm begging you. Um, that's oftentimes a lot of what they're talking about. Um, you know, they're, they're promoting people who are affiliated with the show, but also it's like, don't use these bathrooms. Don't go over here. This area is off limits, blah, 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 blah. So, um, but the, the actual, I would say athlete amenities, but also just the quality of the space. Um, if you're in a theater, um, sometimes the backstage space is very small. Um, it just depends largely on the age of the theater, realistically. Um, if you're in some kind of a convention hall, you're going to have a lot more space because they have discretion on where to place the stage at that point. Um, but also, like, yeah, sometimes the atmosphere in those places can be a little hit or miss. Like, a, a theater has a quality atmosphere to it. An open convention hall where they've shoved in a bunch of folding chairs, little mechanical. Like, eh, yeah, it just doesn't really, really feel like quite the same experience. And so for me... I, I differ from some people on this a little bit. Like I, the venue to me matters just because um, I think, you know, if, if you're at a, um, if you're at a, a show where it's a quality venue, like it feels like your participation of and promotion of that show, like you believe in the product that you're promoting. Like this is a good show um, versus like the show that I'm going to be doing is Battle of the River in Chattanooga on June 8th, just under 10 weeks out from that. It is at a convention hall. I'm like, eh. But the thing is, it's like I needed a show that was right around when that is, and that was really the only option. So sometimes your hands are tied. I would rather not do a show in a convention hall. Um, the last one I did in 2021 was as as uh, as well. Um, my fallback show for this year is the Knox Classic local here in town, which is two months after um, Battle at the River. And it's at the Civic Auditorium um, uh, close to downtown, which is an awesome venue. Um, and the promoter, uh, Bino, he has spared no expense in securing that. I hope to get Bino on here for an interview sometime. I need to see if he'd be amenable to that. Super cool guy. And, um, as far as promoters go, he's kind of like, you know, he, he's in the, the upper tier. He's a good dude. So, um, but also like he, he knows what's important, um, which is having a good venue, um, treating the athletes well and giving them a good experience. Um, and I'd say if your if your promoter brings that kind of um, character and mentality to the show, like I said, it's going to be infectious, and everybody else is going to pick up on that too. Um, so another thing that kind of goes along with this is is back, how much backstage space is there. You know, we kind of talked about that before. If it's really cramped um, and the show is not set up in such a way to accommodate that cramped space, this can be a problem. And one way in which you can accommodate that is say, hey, men start at ten. The women start at two. So you don't have both genders backstage, which really can double or triple the number of people backstage because you're doing men's bodybuilding and then you're doing women's figure. And then it's like, you just cut down on the number of people backstage. Say, look, men are going first or put women first. I think whenever I've seen this format, it's always the men that go first. Let the women go first sometimes. Flip a coin, you know, whatever. Um, I mean, the, the last show that I did had that format where the men went at 10 and I was done with the show completely by one thirty, um, which was great on with my day, go take a shower, go home. You know, that's, that's why I don't have to stick around till midnight. God, I've done that before and it's not fun. I've done that as a spectator before. It's not fun. We've talked about the show experience plenty on here. We'll do it again for sure. But, um, 
there, there's changes to be made. So the show format also is another big thing here. So um, like the Lee Haney games in 2021, they did that segmented format where it was men at 10, women at two. It was awesome. I think the women at two were probably like, what the fuck a little bit, but at the same time, they didn't have to be ready quite so early. So their day is still shorter. They have a little bit more time waiting, but they don't have to be to the venue super early or anything like that. So um, it's still, it's still better. There's still less waiting overall for bullshit to happen. Um, you don't have to have the prejudging finals format, which is what I will be dealing with this year. So it will be a long day. Had a conversation with my wife cause she got invited to, you know, we, we live in Knoxville. Chattanooga is about 90 minutes South of here. She got invited to a baby shower in Atlanta on the same day outside of Atlanta, um, which is another hour and a half or so down. And so she's like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Like, and I, I, you know, as I would tell anybody, I'm like, I do not expect you to be at both prejudging and finals. And of course she said, what's prejudging, what's finals? <laughs> Cause they don't make it easy. That that's the biggest problem that I have with bodybuilding is they don't make it easy for spectators. They make it so that everything has to be explained by somebody in the know. It is not a casual friendly experience for the spectator. Um, so I said, well, you know, you could come to prejudging, go do your shower and then come back for finals if you wanted to, or you could just go back home, whatever. <laughs> that would be fine too. Uh, it's just a lot to ask of anybody to, to come and hang around a show for that long. Um, the quality and the attentiveness of the facilitators and expediters. So the facilitators and expediters are the people who are backstage and on stage. So backstage, like calling out numbers, lining people up, telling people what to do, who's up now, who's up next, who's, who's on deck in after that. And, um, also on stage, helping direct traffic, telling people where to stand. If somebody isn't hearing something, make sure tap them on the shoulder. No, you go over here. So your, your on stage expediter is just incredibly helpful. Um, but you know, if it's somebody who's doing it for the first time, you know, they might not be super skilled at what they're doing. Um, and, uh, a lot of these positions are volunteers or close to it. Um, so, uh, if you have, you know, facilitators who oftentimes, I mean, they're, they got a hard job right backstage trying to wrangle people around. Um, it's like herding cats, you know, herding carb deprived bodybuilders who are completely in their own world and not worrying about anybody else. And you've got to get their attention and get them to stand in a line, like good luck. Um, and to be clear, like I, I would say like anybody backstage is self-absorbed and only worrying about themselves. And I would say that's fair on show day. Like that's what should be happening. <laughs> so I'm not, not saying they're narcissistic. I'm saying they are appropriately focused. Um, but uh, if you've got facilitators who are really good, like people, people, um, and really good at understanding the situation, like, yeah, I've competed. I've been there before. I know what this day is like here. You need to stand over here. Okay. Motherfucker move. Uh, <laughs> but, um, also, like, you know, I, I did have an issue with uh, a client at Universe. This would have been back in, I think, 2019, um, where the expediter kept her off stage, like actively said, no, it's not your turn to go up when she was, in fact, supposed to be on stage. And the head judge didn't stop to think like, hey, we're missing two people because it was her and somebody else. We're missing two people. Where are they? They didn't think to be like, hey, let's let's try and get these people on here. The expediter was confused. They didn't know. My client didn't get to go on stage for finals and uh, ended up uh, not placing because of it. So um, that is what can happen if you have... Uh, uh, an inattentive or inexperienced backstage expediter. That's a worst case scenario because that's the cost of a national show and a cross country flight. This client lived in Hawaii and flew to New Jersey for that show. Um, and so they got, uh, you know, by filing a grievance, they got their registration fee for the show refunded, which was probably the smallest expense of their entire prep. So um, that is, as they say in the in the business, I think this is a technical term, some bullshit. Um, so, and that is also why um, I'll spill some dirt here. That is also why I really I, I I am not a fan of Tyler Mannion because he was the head judge at that show, and I feel like it was at least in part his responsibility. Um, to do something about that. I think that might have been one of his first um, first duties as head judge at a national level show. I'm not sure on that, but I think probably. So I get him, give him a little slack for that, but also every time I see his face, that's what I think of. So um, the MC is another thing. Um, I'll spill some more dirt. At Lee Haney Games 2021, Bob Chick was the MC. I can't fucking stand him. Like... <laughs> whatever your uh, political leanings are, he was making let's go Brandon jokes from the stage. I'm like a bodybuilding show is not the place for that dude. Like shut the fuck up and let people have their moment. You know, it's just not 
appropriate. It's just stupid. And so like, he kind of like almost single handedly ruined that show for me. Um, so, and I've seen other bad MCs. I've seen some great MCs as well. Like Kim Ferris out in Oregon is awesome. Um, he does a great job. So, you know, there's, there's good ones, there's bad ones. Um, and all this, a lot of this comes down to personal preference as well, but it is one of those things that can impact the quality of a show for sure. Um, the stage decor sadly can have an impact. Um, I, I'm not going to go through the archives to find a picture of this, but there was a show in December. It was somewhere in the Midwest. I think it was the something, something winter muscle classic or something like that. And the backdrop on the back of the stage was this giant, ass motherfucking ugly as shit cartoon muscle bound Santa Claus flexing and every photo from every competitor at that show like it was a picture of Santa flexing and the competitors happened to be in front of it like it was all about the artwork on the back of the stage which was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. Like it was a joke. I'm like, who thought this was a good idea? Oh my God. I mean, at some point you've got to have a little bit of consideration for taste. I know it's bodybuilding industry. It's like, it's not really our thing, but you've got to be able to look at something and say like, Hey, I think that's objectively a bad idea. I think that's distracting. I think we're making this about the stage and not about the competitors. Because when you pull up pictures from that show, that is the only thing that you see. You don't see the person on stage. You see, what the fuck is Santa doing back there looking all jacked as shit? I mean, it's ridiculous. So I always got on the, uh, uh, what was it, the show back in Oregon. It was in Lincoln City. The uh, I don't know. They always had these like blow up flamingos on the side of the stage. And I'm like, that is some tacky ass shit. Like get rid of that. But they got nothing on the flexing Santa, which is just a joke. Oh my God. What to expect backstage. Let's get to it. Um, you're, like I said, you're going to find a lot of self-absorbed people and that's okay. These are people who are in, in themselves at the moment because they got a lot of shit going on. They got a lot of things to worry about. They're not worried about you unless you're in their way. So <laughs> always try and kind of like, be out of the way a little bit as best you can. Um, keep to yourself. That's what everybody else is trying to do as well. Um, there's going to be a lot of noise. It's loud. You know, you've got the crowd from um, out there. That, that noise will be spilling over. You're going to hear the head judge. And then there's just the constant din of one to two to 300 people backstage all milling around doing their own shit as well. Um, there should be taped up on the walls back there, competitor lists and order of event sheets. You want to watch those like a hawk. Find the nearest one, set up near one so that you always have the ability to or take a photo of it on your phone so that you know you can always be like, who's lining up right now? That's men's physique. It looks like maybe, I don't know, masters. Okay, cool. And pull it up. Where's men's physique? Okay, cool. So I got this, 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 and this, and then it's me. Okay. Okay, cool. So you're always kind of aware of what it is. And also, um, I think we'll get to this later. I'll, I'll save that. Um, sometimes you're going to have stage monitors, you know, like there will be giant screens that show you what's happening on the stage. So you can kind of follow along and see what's going on, which is a nice touch. And that's something um, good that the promoter can do and set that up for the people backstage. Um, facilitators and expediters running around calling out numbers, yelling at people. That's their job. So it's going to there's going to be a little chaos. There's going to be food and bags fucking everywhere. <laughs> Just all over the place. Everybody's eating, everybody's stuff in their face, everybody's leaving messes behind, everybody's dropping bands on the floor. That's the nature of the business. So um, how do you prepare? Um, what I would strongly recommend, <laughs> this is a, a pro tip here, bring a collapsible chair. Just like you're going for a free music concert in the park, you got your little chair, that fit, the little canvas chair that folds up and fits in the bag, bring one of those so that you've got some place to sit because otherwise you'll probably be on the floor and uh, sitting in a chair is going to be way better. So bring one of those pro tip. You're welcome. Bring all your food and plus more. Um, you know, you're communicating with your coach. Um, if they need you to eat less, that's easy. If they need you to eat more, you might need to make sure that you have more. So ask them beforehand, Hey, if I need to bring more, more of what? And also don't forget utensils. You will always find people backstage eating with their fingers because they packed everything, but they could forgot to bring a fork. So, um, don't be that person bands to pump up always. There may be weights backstage, don't count on it. Um, you might have a packing list from your coach. Check the whole thing. Look over the whole thing and just make sure you're not forgetting anything. Um, know the schedule and the order. Um, this should be posted beforehand, but at the very least, um, you will see it as soon as you get backstage. And so even if you're first up, you'll be backstage soon enough that you can check that out and be like, oh, shit. And usually it's men's open bodybuilding that's first. So um, uh, if, if that's not you, you're probably not first, so you've got a little bit more time to prepare. So um, Also, uh, show up early. Uh, 
do, do not be the person who uh, misses your class because you're like, oh, I got time. Maybe you do. Show up early. Maybe just don't leave the venue at all. Play it safe. Because th- bodybuilding shows usually run pretty slow, but sometimes they run fast. And if that happens and you're not ready for it, you are fucked. And you could waste your entire prep and miss your stage time. It has happened. Um, so some things to watch for. So you pay attention and you listen. Um, so uh, do not wear headphones backstage. That's one of the biggest things. Um, just because you need to be aware of what's going on at all times. It is not the time to zone out. It is the time to pay attention. So um, I always tell people, no headphones backstage. Watch the expediters, see who they were calling for, and check that against the lists of competitors. So it shouldn't just say like Open Men's Physique A. It should say Open Men's Physique A has competitor 31, 32, 33, 34, 35. Like, oh, okay, cool. All right, so then you know. like that. You need to check those lists. Be aware of where you are at all times. Get a sense for how quickly they're moving because once it gets to the point where you're about 10 minutes out from stage time, 12 minutes out from stage time, that's when you need to start getting things moving as far as like, you know, a last-minute carb up with some high-sugar carbs perhaps if that's the plan um, and to start pumping up as well. Understand the categories that take the most time. So these would be the larger categories. If you see that Open Bikini Class C has 16 women in it, that class is going to take a while to get through. If you see that, you know, figure from True Novice, Novice, Open, and Masters has four total competitors, that entire category is going to get blazed through in about three minutes. So, um, like, look at the specific categories like men's bodybuilding, women's physique, classic physique they have more poses to run through um some of those classes may be large like women's physique at a local npc show might only have a couple few people in it so they've got more poses to run through but they don't have to do a whole whole bunch of call outs or anything like that so um they're going to blaze through that pretty quickly um classic physique if you've got 10 to 15 guys in a class uh, that class is going to be out there for a while so um learn learn um what the other classes have to do on stage and how the class size affects how long they might be out so you can make some kind of reasonable estimation as to how far out you are from being on stage um, and estimate the pace. That's what I'm talking about here. In about 10 to 12 minutes before you go up on stage is when, when you want to start your pump up. Um, tan and bronzing touch-ups will usually be just prior to that and you will likely be called into a line for that by the expediters as well. So that's that. That's what to expect backstage. So um, it's, uh, it's a little wild and crazy for sure. Um, it, it's chaos. Sometimes if you're lucky, it's organized chaos. Um, if you're unlucky, it's just pure shit show level chaos, which does happen. And I've known people who kind of thrive in those situations. I am not one of them. <laughs> I, I like my chaos ordered. Thank you very much. So Ladies and gentlemen, that has been episode 251. I thank you very much for hanging out with me here. Um, once again, recapping everything. I am Darren Starr, fivestarphysique.com, full-time online prep coach. I'm going to see if I have all this shit memorized right now. I'm not, I'm not pulling off notes. See, I'm just, I'm, I'm right here. I'm right here. I'm looking at you, not notes. Full-time online contest prep and transformation coach. You can check out fivestarphysique.com for details on my coaching programs, workout programs. You can read more about this podcast. I have merch up there as well if you want some cool swag, not this. I took off the hoodie I was wearing earlier. That's available up there. Um, you can check out Five Star Digital for information on Bikini Blueprint and other courses that will be going online soon. Uh, like the video, subscribe to the channel if you're feeling kind, leave a comment down below if you're watching this on YouTube and tell me what you want to hear more about in the future. If you're listening online, thank you. Appreciate it. Sorry, if you're listening to an audio only version online, thank you. And, um, leave a review if you can, um, leave a rating wherever you're listening and certainly call in. I did not mention the call in number once before 865-518-6569. Leave a message. Um, I have had a couple people threaten that they are going to do it. I'm still waiting for those messages. So call uh, call in, leave a message, leave your questions, leave your comments, and we'll play those on air. That has been it. So it's episode 251. Guess what? 252, I already have outlined. I already know what I'm talking about. It's a fucking week away. I already know what I'm talking about. That's how on my game I am right now. Watch out. Okay, that wraps up another episode, and thank you all so much for watching. If you like this episode, please share it on social media and tag me on Instagram. I am at Darren underscore star. Also, please subscribe to the channel here if you haven't already, and feel free to check out any of those other videos that you see here as well. 5starphysique.com has details on everything that I have to offer, including contest prep coaching, body transformation coaching, workout programs, swag, and a whole lot more. 
Thanks again for listening, and I will catch you all back here next week.